After six years, one of Australia's best-loved dramas is taking a final bow. What a way we've come. Not much further to go. And in true Ash Park fashion... Come on, Libby! ..we won't be going out without a fight. You bastard! ..a reunion... ..and the odd betrayal. For the first time, I think we might not make it. Our upcoming season is the final ever of the Logie and Actor Award winning A Place to Call Home. The suspense is delicious. <laughs> so we wanted to celebrate our epic family saga with you, the cast and the crew, and take a look at the highly anticipated sixth and final season. I'm Noni Hazelhurst, and this is A Place to Call Home the final chapter. Action! A Place to Call Home was brought to life in April 2013 and it's the creation of award-winning writer Bevan Lee. It sounds really weird, but Inverness is as real to me as this reality talking to you. I wanted to go to a place that had survived a cataclysm and the Second World War was, and then I wanted to have a female character, a woman who survived horrors and monstrosities, was really shut off, and then as the show went on, it came to be able to share those with the world. I was in a German camp for two years. The web of story is so intricately woven, you never know what's coming next. Why do we watch series? We, we want to see each week the characters reveal more of each other. And so the narrative will come out of that. They carry the building blocks to make narratives that our audiences admire. Perhaps one day you may enlighten us about your clearly colourful past. And action! You go into the show thinking you know where it's going and uh, things change, the plot twists in a way that you hadn't imagined. Sir Richard Bennett, we're arresting you for the murder of Mrs Regina Bly. There are so many people that, you know, work their butts off, excuse me, uh, to make this show what it is and, you know, it's the details in this show are unbelievable. Costume department, hair and makeup, set design, so much that goes into this show. I have the very easy job of stepping into all of this and just remembering a couple of words. Bevan's done a wonderful job because it's just rare in Australian television to, to um, be surrounded by such quality, not only with our crew, and certainly with the actors that I work with. Being an Australian, sometimes you can feel like you are an island uh, on the edge of the world. And what Australian drama does is it puts us into the centre of the world. And so our conversation and our voice becomes as important as everybody else's. I think Fox Hill's commitment to Australian drama has had a significant impact and will continue to have one um, in connecting Australian audiences together. What really appeals to me about the work that I do is that it does have a chance to communicate with people and it does have a chance to make people feel connected to each other as opposed to divided and separate and fearful. Go get your name is on a list of troublemakers. <laughs> as we become closer to each other because it's easier to get to each other, we need to get ready to have those sorts of conversations. So for me, that starts with drama and that's what Foxtel are doing. They're having an international conversation. Good this is 1953, Grandmother. Some standards are timeless. Part of the appeal of A Place to Call Home has been its faithful portrayal of a bygone era. It's set in the often overlooked post-war period of Australian history, specifically the years 1953 to 1959. <laughs> we have been as true as we can to, to those periods, not only in the way we make everything look, but the way we make people behave. I love this era. I was totally born in the wrong era. I love the style, the furniture, the, the clothing, everything. Oh, it's pretty special for a costume designer, this show. We don't do stole, sister. <laughs> 
you have an amazing period to work in with the beautiful lines of the 50s and the colours and the fabrics. If my eyes don't deceive me, she's wearing Dior. She is. Dior. I find that the, particularly the women's magazines just hilarious to think how we were so con. <laughs> Let me see. How advertising started and how primitive it was and what it promised, you know, and we all fell for it in the 50s. <laughs> I'll often look at the newspaper for the day before I start just to get some inspiration or the Women's Weekly of that period. You know, they're terrific resources. Yeah, we'd wheel the odd historical character in. Thankfully we found a guy who looks like Robert Menzies. Get on your bob! <laughs> but history is the colour of the show. I think I was more interested in projecting an emotional history, something that indicated what the landscape was back then emotionally. Times are changing. Could be time you change too. That's part of the story of our show, is the changing world and how it affects the family and how it affects all the characters in the family. And it's all about confronting that change. It's a changing world, my darling. Let's see how many changes I can accommodate. <laughs> Regardless of the fact that we're further back in time, it's, it's a place where people can see themselves and their grandparents and their children. In this day and age, as we're individualised and sort of torn apart and put into little rooms by ourselves on tiny little screens, swiping up or sideways, however you do it. It's a nice time to take a breath and remember when we actually talk to each other, walk somewhere to meet someone, and didn't have that instant gratification. Forgive my presumption in saying this, but sometimes when you've nowhere to go, home's where you are. I think people appreciate the simplicity and the slowness of seeing another time. I think they appreciate the respect. I think they appreciate seeing that people essentially are always the same. Our world of Inverness might be set 60 years ago, but its themes touch us all and are still relevant today. I felt it was very important, for example, to go back there and be honest to the times. Even good people back then said dreadful things about Indigenous people. I just saw an Abbo chap driving out of here. Aboriginal prudence. Marvellous, isn't it? The Postable Homes had an opportunity to touch on a lot of issues before. This is a great chance for them to touch on Indigenous issues. Some may feel uncomfortable about... No problem with the Aboriginals. I'm sure you don't. Mm. And he's a great character, Frank. I like him because he's set at a time in 1958. He's still not quite a human being in Australian society. We're back to being classified as flora and fauna. We don't need that. We just want to be treated as human beings. Well, front page news, sunshine. Cops don't worry about black fellas. It just shows us how far we've come, in a lot of ways. It's made us some good storylines, and I really enjoyed it, yeah. While some issues were front and centre in the 1950s, others weren't even discussed. Back in the 50s, there was no such thing as post-traumatic stress disorder. Men confronted horrors beyond imagination. They came back, and they were told to just get on with it. Be a man! <laughs> now, that led to a lot of male dysfunction in that generation, but I found it very, very interesting. In a way, the whole show is a six-season journey to recovery from damage. You're a good man. <laughs> <laughs> our job, or perhaps our burden, is always to see things from two points of view, including... Homophobia. Uh, homophobia. <laughs> Come on, get up. Come on, you pervert! <laughs> Being homosexual in the 1950s wasn't easy at all. Some families did used to take their sons and stick them in asylums and have the doctor stick knitting needles into their brain to lobotomise them because that would stop them wanting other men. Any phobia often comes from a distance, you know, like Jew the Jewishness and the gayness and the Italians, you know, it comes from a distance and not being able to empathise. Must the child be Jewish? It would affect him his whole life, ostracised on so many levels. How 
can I not raise my son as Jewish? The Bly is a Church of England. The Nordmans aren't. That's the beauty about a lot of the characters, is that whilst they're all set in the 1950s, all the issues they're dealing with are still really relevant today. The proof that the themes of A Place to Call Home have touched so many people is in our loyal fan base, who we've met at special screenings with the cast. It's so fantastic and I'm amazed that I'm even here. Or on trips to Ash Park. The fans have been so devoted and supported us so wholeheartedly, which is beautiful. It's been extraordinary and uh, I feel so very blessed. Oh, we just love the show so much, mainly because I can relate to the 50s. It takes me back to the era that I grew up in, in the country. Oh, I love all the characters, the era, the clothing, the cars. I love the country life. I love the lifestyle of the, that particular period in time. You know, she's really loved, and I, and I mean, everyone was stopping me talking about the show, but talking about Anna's journey and seeing how she's developed. And I just was crying on the streets with strangers in London. Um, I just love that perhaps something that I do resonates with people and what they've been through. I didn't know you couldn't conceive. Oh. <laughs> Season five was so heartbreaking and sad, and there were a lot of fans that were not happy with, with Henry's behavior. And man, did I hear about it. We have better uses for the bed, sister. He can sober up outside. He's going into a diabetic coma. Sister, and you'd have seen it if you'd bothered to look. I think Which you might have if he were white. Through when we got canceled, to supporting us and nurturing us, and making us feel wanted again when we got picked up and excited. <laughs> You know, we now have thousands of fans all over the world who are in contact with us. In Holland and Israel and all these wild places, you know. It was just such a joy to see their joy in a way because they love the show. They just love it. Yeah! And it's not just our wonderful fans who've loved our story with all its twists and turns. We in the cast and crew and the creators also have six years worth of wonderful memories. There's absolute bonuses in some of those big, big set piece scenes where all the players are in. This happy event, however, gives me hope. Those are amazing days in that you all get to hang out together. My favourite scene, it's very special, is when I get proposed to. <clears throat> <laughs> Olivia Bly, will you marry me? I mean, I'm married, but I proposed to my husband. So I never got to do that thing where you're standing there and he's asking you and you're all... <laughs> because I was the asker. Yes, Matthew Goddard, I believe I will. <laughs> I was worried you'd say no. <laughs> I've never been more certain of anything. Maybe Regina slapping me. Didn't she slap me like four times? <gasps> Rude. I never got a slap back. So yeah, that. Whipping her with the flowers. Good thing too. She needed a good whipping. You've no business here at all. Monster. I, I pick up the baby that's playing Sarah's baby and I'm kind of clutching it and sweating and screaming obscenities and things like that. But the baby kept falling asleep. <laughs> All of the scenes we shoot in Roy's house. Oh, maybe when I tell him that James is gay, that's hilarious. Nah, pull the other one. He is. It's truth. That was a beautiful scene to play. Thank you, it was very funny. My favourite scene that we've shot so far was the scene through uh, some miracle. <laughs> Um, Anna, in the, we had that night uh, together, very special night together in season five, which was an absolute hoot to shoot. <laughs> um, we had a lot of fun filming that scene. Are we doing what I think we are? She said that to Gina on series three. Anna's got a line. She's got a line in the bedroom. <laughs> and it's, are we doing what I think we are? Oh my God.
I think the show is so surprising narratively because I surprise myself. Surprise! So whenever it gets to a point where what would happen, I go, that would happen, and then I step back and go, OK, turn it on its head. Especially the moment, for example, when Regina shot Brian Taylor. Wait! You do not want to go back to your stupid, stupid wife! Do you? I had no intention till I came to that scene of her shooting him and I just got there and they're having a scene in the car and I thought, well, what if she took a gun out and shot him? <laughs> and that turns everything on its head. You can't walk six years in the shoes of a character. Ah, oh, excuse me, ma'am. Oh, you, you can't go in there. Without learning a thing or two about yourself. I was tasked with your education and I'm the one that's learned the lesson. I think Olivia taught me love saves the day. You know, she just, she got a lot of love, this girl. And I've really enjoyed living with that. <laughs> Hello, stranger. She has taught me through the years. She's taught me not to doubt myself and um, to embrace my instincts and my spontaneity. I think an actor always learns something from the roles they play and I've sort of learned a lot about my mum from doing this because she was very secretive and would never share anything about her life. So many secrets. It's made me doubly determined to not be like that with my own children or with anyone, really. I spent most of my life trying to control my children. I didn't want them to grow up. Whether it sticks or not, she's got a hell of a lot more humility than I do. Oh, Mrs Bly! Oh, struck dumb with the honour of being invited in. I think that's been something to uh, to learn, yes. Most importantly for me is not to take things for granted. Henry is a, a guy who seems to have it all together and keeps kind of getting the rug pulled out from under him. I thought I was going to lose everything. He always manages to, in some way, collect himself again and find his feet. If he's taught me anything, it's to kind of face it head on and there's always a way forward, there's always a way through it, around it, over it. Playing Sarah has taught me how to be a little bit more considered. And I feel probably more gracious. I try to be quieter. <laughs> She's very, very reserved and, and at peace with herself. The audiences don't watch to see you, they watch to see themselves. And I think that the characters are all so layered and so complex and there's no archetypes, you know, it's not anyone's just the one thing. We're all layered and we're all complicated people. Here's to our complicated lives. While all good things must come to an end, we still have one last momentous season ahead. Surprise! <laughs> and a wonderful one, my darling. Welcome home. <laughs> this whole season, they're madly in love with each other. Sarah takes over Ash Park, and so you get the potential of what she would have become as Mrs. Bly. What do you think? That's good. Mm, now we're a Jewish home. Ash Park has a new mistress. I never guessed how hard it would be until it was. <laughs> the time of going to rock bottom and then kind of climbing from the ashes, and I think she certainly does, and Lizzie starts creeping back in. If any of you hear me worrying about George and Sarah, feel free to pull me up. They're forging a new life and they don't need me in constant commentary. The James Bly that you see in episode one, season one, is not the same character as the James Bly in season six. He's living his best life. He is enjoying himself, he's in love. James did the right thing for himself and he has to face up to that. And part of that is facing the music with Henry. You brought me here with the promise of forever and then found your Riviera route. Welcome home. Not anymore. There were some storylines that were still left wide open. One of them was definitely Jack and Caro. They're not in a good place still. Season five was a bit of a rough one for Caro in terms of not feeling like she had a place in the world. The journey that she's been on is extraordinary from very different to season five where she goes in season six. An opportunity is 
gifted to her and the little tiny pilot light that's been burning inside sort of gets a full ignition. It's a rough road going into the last block. If a Jack is about to face some very big changes and he's probably in a worse place than you will ever see him or have seen him in the past. It's very powerful. At the very least, the very least, have some respect for this family. To the world you are a bligh. Act like one. Anna's journey is quite extraordinary. She has a really surprising event happen and it means that she has to take on the world and she does so and she boldly puts her foot down and says, this is the way I'm gonna do it, which shocks everyone. It can't stay a secret forever. Olivia, she's got a beautiful man, everything's rosy, but there are some things in her past that have to come out. I won't be a victim again. Season six will bring new twists, new threats, and even more surprises. If he wasn't already injured, I'd knock his bloody block off. I think this season is better than anything that's come before. But to me, it's mm. the pinnacle of the show. The flamboyance is back, the joie de vivre is back. We have music and it's very bohemian, really allowing the subculture of Sydney to come out and play. It will be a really satisfying emotional experience and hopefully everyone who's stuck with us from series one all the way to the end will come out of it with great joy and sadness. As we approach the finale, I am very happy where we leave Anna. I'm really sad to say goodbye to her because I feel like she is, um, at times, everything I could be. She's kind of the best of me, and so I hope I can carry her for the rest of my life, but I'll be so sad to put her to bed. Very sad. A place to call home has always been an emotional roller coaster for the characters. <laughs> But for the cast and crew filming the last scenes ever, there really wasn't a dry eye in the house. It is sad. We had our last table read of the final two scripts the other day, which was pretty emotional. I don't think anyone was kind of expecting it to be that emotional. But they're beautiful episodes. Bevan's finished things off so perfectly for everyone. And that is the right shot for Tom, Tim, Sus and Noni. This has been the most extraordinary journey for all of us, I suspect, and I, I have so much respect for every single person in this room who's worked on this show. You're all absolutely knackered, and <laughs> you guys never get a day off. We do, and you, you know, you've seen me at my best, you've seen me at my not-so-best, you've never seen me at my worst because you didn't have to. I've never felt so supported by any group of people as I have on this show, and I feel like you're my family. <laughs> In fact, I've come here for relief from the real... <laughs> Noni's pretty much said it all, but I just want to... Oh, I want to thank you all so much for changing not only my craft, but my personal life, being so generous and supportive and tireless in all your work. It's <laughs> my bow. It's been amazing working with you. Thank you. <laughs> The show will finish in a way explaining exactly what the title means. My aunt gave me a, um, a welcome mat to put out when I found a place to call home. A place to call home and finding home is such a beautiful notion and I think Bevan has done it masterfully. Something Bevan does in his writing, the way that he plots is that it never finishes how you imagine it will. Was it worth it? Of you. It all looked good from my bed. It all comes and goes. All these